Well, and sometimes I forget. It's okay if you can't think of any, no problem. It's are not. So, so far as a church officially, uh, we only support one missionary. Uh, that would be Brother Vicky. Well, Brother, uh, yeah, Brother Vicky, I won't say where. Are you alive? Yeah. Okay. I just, I just won't say where he's from. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he, uh, for, for security purposes. Um, it's like it's a dude, no. Right, yeah, he uh, uh, basically just a friend of Brother Verhoof. So you, I don't know if you remember Brother Verhoof from Switzerland. He came through here and was telling about some of the ministries and uh, one of the people that he's working with um, as a church, we support him for 50 bucks a month, and that really helps that ministry there. Um, so if you, maybe I'll send out an email this week, and I'll just write down all the people that have been here and uh, that we've mentioned in the past, and maybe they'll come to mind, and, oh, yeah, I like that guy a lot. Yeah, I think I'd like to put him on there. And that way, I'll give you guys a selection of some people. And then, of course, if you have any other questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Real, yeah, those are all Bible-believing missionaries, absolutely. Yeah, if, if, for example, if you're like, man, I'd love to support somebody in Ireland, but I don't know of anybody, you can go to the Final Fight website and, oh, there's a guy in Ireland, I want to f support him, just because he's in Ireland, you know, or whatever. So that would be fine, too. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah, basically, you can't go wrong. Any Sending out money to the missionaries, you know, it's just a good thing all around. So, And as a church, I, I really believe that that should be a, something that we should do what we can, you know. Uh, to the best of our ability. All right, let's go ahead and get started this morning. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. This is a somewhat of a continuation of the previous sermon that I did I, uh, last week, and this is going to kind of build on that. And I'm going to do my best to try and present this the right way because there's a fine line with some of this stuff and you can go too far on one side and too far on the other and that's kind of why I, I drew this guy this uh, what do they call this uh, is it kind of park horse tarp type stuff you know tightrope tight well th this is actually supposed to be a steel beam but I know you can't tell balance beam yeah this is like have you seen those guys that are on uh, on these YouTube channels where they they like walking on cranes you know at the top and they like hang with one hand under cranes and Rooftop. Yes, rooftop to rooftop. I've seen guys do stand on these steel girders in New York City, and they do backflips, and all there is is that steel beam, and they've got no, nothing holding them up or anything. So if they fall and mess up, they're done. Yeah. And uh, it, actually, I've, I've watched uh, compilations of those videos, and it, it really fills me with anxiety just watching. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I know they're not going to show anything bad, but I just know that this is... This could go so wrong so fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You only get one shot and you mess it up and you're done. And so when it comes to this stuff, you, there has to be a, a very fine balance. And when it comes to these guys that do this stuff, you know, one wrong move and you're going down and you're going way down. And when it comes to what I'm going to be discussing today is uh, basically without getting too ahead of myself, there, there's a need for a proper balance. And on one side, a person can fall into sin, right? And that's going to be destructive. And as Bible believers, we say, oh, yeah, absolutely. We, you know, we're, we preach against sin. We're hard against sin. It's easy as, especially if you've been in church for a long time, maybe you were raised in church. This sometimes, obviously sin is always a problem for everybody, but, you know, the addictions, the drugs, you know, the prostitution, all that stuff, that, that's not going to be something that's going to be a pitfall for most Christians. It can be, but not always. And so a lot of times we think, well, as long as I'm not falling over on this side, I'm good. But there is another pitfall that I feel that uh, is easy also for people with more of a religious background to fall into, and that would be in this realm of, I'm going to call it man-made, uh, I'll even throw in there, religious traditions. This is another pitfall that uh, is not generally perceived as a pitfall. And I'm going to show you this morning that it is a pitfall, and it can be just as damaging and deadly as the pitfall of sin, maybe even more so, uh, but that's debatable. Matthew 23, verse 1, 
Then <clears throat> spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say, and do not. For they bind heavy burdens, and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Now, last week I preached on the subject of the most subtle hypocrisy, and basically explained how these Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat, and uh, they were in that position, and so their responsibility was to teach people the Word of God. Their responsibility was to judge justly, help the poor and needy, and those type of things. Uh, but they did none of those things. As custodians of the Scriptures, you know, they were supposed to teach people what God says. They were supposed to be the representative for God to the people as the religious leaders of their day. They were supposed to tell people what God says, but instead they were teaching people what man says. They were supposed to preach the Scripture, but instead they spent all their time preaching tradition. And they taught the tradition while holding up a roll of Scripture and saying, Thus saith the Lord. That's the big problem. Um, they would hold up the Scripture and they would say, God says. And so you'd be sitting there waiting, Okay, I want to hear what does God have to say. But then they would, what would follow is what man actually says, what the fathers say, what the rabbis have taught, not what God said. And so the people would come away with the perception that, well, the traditions are the will of God. And they, insert, they brought their tradition to the level of God's commandment. In other words, they gave the people the pr impression that the traditions of the Jewish fathers were the requirements of God. Like I said, they brought tradition to the level of God's commandment. And that is a very subtle hypocrisy. And it involves a man saying, God says, commandment from Scripture. Okay? But in reality, what they're doing and following is what man says, tradition. They say God says, and then they do not what God says, but instead do what man says. And, the, and Jesus told the people, do not after their works. What are their works? Well, look at verse 5. Their works, all their works, they do to be seen of men. It was their traditions. All their religious rules and regulations. They did all that stuff to be seen of men. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. And Jesus said, do not after their works. Now, as I've mentioned before, traditions are not necessarily bad in and of themselves, and they can be a good thing as long as they're kept in their right place. You say, well, what's the right place? The right place would be something distinct from the commandments of God. It's, everybody has various traditions that they do and things that they... Uh, uh, try to live their life by and follow uh, their life according to. But there needs to be the understanding that, okay, this is my tradition, and this is God's commandment. And they never the twain shall meet. <laughs> and this is what I think is good for my life, but if you don't think it's good for your life, that's your business. But we can all agree that the commandments of God are for everybody, but I'm not going to raise my tradition to the level of God's commandment. And I hope that makes sense. Uh, traditions can be all right as long as they're done with the right motives. My desire is to please God, not to impress people. Sometimes religion, like I said, this is the pitfall of someone, I'll, I'll just say someone like myself, who, is, who grew up in church, who has a desire to do something for God. If the devil can't push you this way, he'll try to push you that way. And so you got to watch out for that. And maybe you're the type of person, you're more along the inclination of this side. All right? There's, there's help for you. There's strength for you. And you can get victory over that. But maybe you're also the person this morning that is more inclined toward this side. And you have to be just as careful about this thing as, you, as someone else might have to be about this thing. Right? All right? So when, a, so when a tradition or any tradition becomes elevated to the height of a biblical commandment, a very serious error has occurred, and a heavy burden has been created. So last week I preached on the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. This morning I'm going to preach on the burden of the Pharisees. And Jesus said in verse 4, For they bind heavy burdens, and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Now, of course, these are not literal burdens. The Pharisees didn't have a moving company. They didn't put things on people's shoulders and say, hey, carry this thing. Okay, it's metaphorical, allegorical, whatever. The term he heavy burdens has to do with the traditions and these spiritual burdens that they would place 
on people's shoulders, and they were heavy for the people. The traditions that these Pharisees were creating were causing people to be weighed down in their lives. These rules and regulations caused the people to be encumbered in their lives. And bear in mind, the Pharisees were all for it. The Pharisees were all for these traditions and all for the rules and regulations. Yeah, we got to keep going it, you know, keep on pushing these things forward. But bear in mind that, you know, the Pharisees benefited from these traditions. They benefited financially. They benefited in their position, you know, in their prestige in the community, right? Because if you're a Pharisee, hey, you get all, you get a part of this money that comes in through the ministry. Uh, you get to have the uppermost rooms at feasts and in chief seats in the synagogues. But what do the people get? You know, they get nothing. And the other thing is, is Jesus isn't saying that the, that the Pharisees load the weight on you and they're fat, lazy slobs who do nothing. That's not the accusation that Jesus is making. These Pharisees carried all the same traditions that they enforced the people to carry. They did all the things that they told the people to do. I went over that last week. That wasn't the problem. They were carrying the burdens, but they, hey, it wasn't too big of a deal for them because they benefited from it. Whereas the people, they were simply crushed under it. And Jesus said, you guys won't even help those people to move those <clears throat> burdens you put on them. You don't even lift a finger to help them. The religious practices that these Pharisees were imposing were not required by God, uh, but they were required by men required by the Pharisees. And these religious practices resulted in a form of spiritual bondage. And so what I want you to think about this morning as I go through this, I'm not going to I'm going to try to refrain from using specific examples, but think about this in your own life. Try to examine your own heart and see in your past if maybe uh, some of the things that you've perceived as the commandment of God, maybe it's not the commandment of God. Maybe there's some certain things you've elevated to that level, but like the Pharisees, you've made the mistake in thinking that your tradition must be upheld when really it was, it's never technically something that God required. You can beat yourself up a lot if you fail in your own Pharisaical traditions because you think God is after you, think God is angry with you because you messed up when really... He never required that of you in the first place. You just put that on yourself. And so this can be a form of spiritual bondage. And so what I'm hoping this morning is, number one, I want to bring to light. I want to shine some light on, on this and just ask some honest questions about some of this. And then number two, if you've been entrapped in a form of spiritual bondage or if you feel the heavy weight upon you of man-made tradition, that maybe it can be identified this morning and maybe you can get some freedom. All right? These religious practices, like I said, they resulted in spiritual bondage. And it's, it is interesting that bondage can come in the form of religion. You don't really think of it that way. When we think of bondage, we would generally think of sin, right? Jesus said, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, right? So when we think of bondage, of course, yeah, we think of sin. We think of the chains of sin and all that. Uh, and sin certainly also has a heavy weight and heavy burdens and brings, brings about bondage. And uh, when it comes to sin, I mean, you think about this. There are people that are, that are in sin's grasp that they don't even know it, right? A lot of times, sometimes that's the case. When it comes to sinful bondage, it's uh, very difficult for people to escape those chains when they're held in them. And total freedom can be granted, but total freedom comes by Jesus Christ, right? When it comes to sin's bondage. And there's going to be a problem if you try to hold Jesus Christ in one hand and sin in the other, right? Would we all agree with that? But now think of this. Consider how similar the bondage of religion can be. People that are in its grasp sometimes don't even know it. It is very difficult for people to escape the chains of man-made religious tradition. And total freedom can be granted, but total freedom comes through Jesus Christ. Right? And there's going to be a problem if you try to claim the righteousness of Jesus Christ in one hand, and try to claim the righteousness of man-made tradition in the other hand. There's going to be a problem. There's going to be a contradiction there. Uh, was not that the problem in the early church 
that Paul and the apostles dealt with. They, they had claimed the righteousness of Christ in one hand, but in the other hand, they kept trying to hold on to the righteousness of circumcision or the righteousness of keeping the Old Testament law. And that was a problem that was addressed in the book of Galatians specifically. Paul said this about that. He told those Galatians that had that problem, he said, are you so foolish? Are you so foolish? Are you so stupid? <laughs> Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? What are you thinking? That's the problem. But that, that's so easy to do with, when it comes to religious traditions. It's really easy to do. Religious traditions are supposed to be good, but they can end up causing bondage as well. Instead of the black chains of sin, you have the white chains of man-made religious tradition. What's worse, black chains or white chains? chains yeah, it's a chain of chains. It's not a racist question, it's just a chain. It's, it doesn't matter what color the chains are, if they're black or white. Sinful bondage is uh, on falling off the left side of the building. Religious tradition is falling off the right side of the building. Which one's worse? <laughs> well, I don't think it really matters. <laughs> you know? it's, uh, they're both bad. Consider this, uh, people often wind up in sinful bondage through temptation, People often wind up in religious bondage through tradition. Hmm. And sinful bondage is, is imposed upon people who love themselves and they desire to please themselves. That's usually the people that are going to fall into sinful bondage. I love myself. I just want to do what I want. So you, woo, you fall into <coughs> sinful bondage. But you know what religious bondage is? It's also fairly easy to impose upon people. A person who has a heart toward God and a desire to please God, which you should, oftentimes can be receptive to the idea of doing various things, you know, to please God. And you want to obey God, you want to please God because you love God. And that's a good thing, but that can make you susceptible to religious bondage, and you have to watch out for that. Just as a man would have to watch out for temptation, you have to be really careful with tradition. You just got to be careful. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying you got to be careful. A spiritually authoritative figure can come along and say, well, you know, if you want to please God, you need to do this, 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 and this. And unfortunately, what happens a lot of times is the tendency is to simply believe this spiritual authority figure without ever checking what the Bible says about it or what the Holy Spirit says about it, right? You're putting yourself in a spiritually dangerous position when you believe someone without verifying it with your two sources of truth. As a Christian, your two sources of truth are the Word of God and the Holy Spirit inside of you. You should always run everything through that filter. <laughs> okay? What, who's the authority? The Word of God and God Himself. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit. You can't put a man above those authorities. Well, I know the Bible doesn't say it, and I don't really feel like the Lord's leading me, but so-and-so said I have to. Okay? you got to watch out for that. People uh, often bind themselves with rules and regulations thinking that they are doing what God wants when in reality God had nothing to do with that. And a man or a religious system put that on you. And those Pharisees would place a religious burden on a, on a man's spiritual shoulders and then walk away. And then after you've borne that for a while, they'd say, well, hey, here's another one you should do. Oh, and now you've been, uh, been doing this for a while. Here's another tradition for you to keep. And here's another, and here's another. And then a special guest Pharisee comes in and holds a you know, weekend conference on, this is a great tradition. You've got to hear about this. So this is another good tradition that you should do. And puts another tradition on you. <laughs> you've got to watch out for some of that stuff. And in order to maintain your good standing with the synagogue and the religion, you have to keep all of the traditions. At first, you know, you have the zeal and the enthusiasm to carry the things around. You even wear it as a badge of honor. Look at what I'm carrying around. You know, you feel like you fit in the group. But after years and years, the rules and the regulations begin to wear you down and wear your wife down and especially wear your kids down like a weight. And sooner or later, someone's going to crack under the pressure of that stuff. A 10-pound weight is nothing. Two 10-pound weights is still hardly anything. But as you begin to add one light weight after another, after another, after another, and then you have to carry that for a long length of time, these little weights start to add up. And it gets harder and harder to move. You're not in a cage, but you might as well be, right? <laughs> because you cannot move. You're not in literal chains, but you might as well be because you have no freedom under religious tradition and uh, religious man-made systems sometimes. 
Religious traditions that are exalted to the place of divine, divine commandments are heavy burdens and spiritual chains. And an outsider who's not involved with that stuff, they might come along, you know, and say, hey, buddy, you know, you're miserable, your family's falling apart, and your religious practices provide you nothing in return. Why don't you just drop it and leave those burdens? But it sounds easy to an outsider, but to someone familiar with this type of thing, leaving a system of religious bondage is about as easy as loosing your own shackles and breaking out of a prison cell. I think of people that, uh, you know, are in this Scientology cult, the Roman Catholicism cult, Mormonism cult, the FLDS, man. There's all kinds of, there's all kinds of similar things. It's all human nature and religious tradition bondage. The people that are in those groups, it's, you say, well, why don't you just leave? It's ruining your life. It's ruining your family. What benefit do you get from that? But it's not that easy. It sound, it's easy to say, kind of like someone that's stuck on drugs. Why don't you just quit? <laughs> well, it's a little harder than that. You know, you just don't understand. And so somebody in these type of systems, it's not easy to get out of that stuff. Um, you know why it's so hard for people to break free from religious oppression? It always boils down to one common denominator. There's probably different reasons, but it always usually gets down to one thing, and it's fear. Fear of the unknown, number one. Their religion or their church is all they know. The outside world might as well be Mars to them. They've been in the system for so long that the thought of leaving it is terrifying and fills them with anxiety. And even though uh, they're in bondage, they feel safe because they're familiar with the walls of their cage, right? And uh, that's what they're familiar with. And even though they're being oppressed and abused by maybe a religious leader or a system, they cling to it because they've been convinced that they themselves are nothing and they're worthless without that man or without that group. If I leave, I'm nothing. And so I have to stay. It's kind of like a religious version of Stockholm Syndrome, right? Uh, the other thing is maybe fear of God's punishment. Fear of God's punishment. They've been convinced that these traditions are God's commandments. These man-made traditions are God's commandments. They actually believe that, and they're afraid of breaking the tradition. And if they break the tradition, they're therefore disobeying God, and therefore God's going to be angry with them, right? And they're going to have to suffer His punishment. And many religious groups and cults go so far as to say, if you don't keep our list of rules and regulations, you're going to be in danger of hellfire, that's usually the thing that's, that people are threatened with, and that's why they never leave. Because I'd rather stay here and be miserable now for my life than go to hell and be miserable forever, right? That's the mentality that goes through these people's minds. Uh, it's a misplaced fear. They think that God will punish them for not keeping the traditions, when in reality, God won't punish them because they never broke His commandment in the first place. It was never His commandment that, they were imposed, that, were, that was imposed upon them. They just don't know that. How about this one? The fear of excommunication. Uh, people often have all of their social and familiar, familial relationships within a religious group. And leaving or being expelled from the religious group will often cost you your job. It'll cost you your friends and it'll cost you your family. And anyone who's been in a group like that for over a decade usually has all their friends and social contacts within a group. Usually it only takes 10 years to have your whole life in a particular group. Okay? And so even though they're burdened down with these traditions of the Pharisees, these people have to decide if they would rather keep carrying the heavy burdens of the Pharisees right, and keep their relationships, or take off the heavy burden of the Pharisees, but they know if they do that, they're going to lose everything. Because they'll be expelled from the group. But you're not carrying the heavy burden. You're not with us. <laughs> right? So they lose their friends and everybody they know and their job often. You say, what is that? That's fear. That's fear of man. Not fear of God. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. As in a rope. As in a trap. As in a bondage. Is a snare. The psychology of religious bondage has always been really interesting to me. I love watching shows about cults because it's just amazing how the human mind is and how people act in certain ways. And mind control, I've always thought, you know, MK Ultra is so fascinating to me. You know, just the way that people can manipulate groups of people. And sometimes the people know they're being manipulated, but they allow it anyway. 
And they do it and they continue. It's just, it's really incredible to me. Uh, like I said, if you've ever watched a documentary on the Colts or the Leah Remini series on Scientology, uh, you can observe the mental and emotional bondage that religious oppression creates. And, the, and then they, you see these people that they start to realize the truth, but then they start understanding the social dilemma that they find themselves in because of the ultimatums that have been imposed upon them by their religious system. If I leave, I'm going to suffer great punishment. And it's difficult. Uh, it's very difficult. The ultimatum of a Pharisee is, if you lay that burden down, you're going to be ostracized from the group, God will curse you with a miserable life, and you will probably go to hell. That's the Pharisees. That's the heavy burden of the Pharisees that I'm talking about this morning. Maybe you've never been in a situation like that, and thank God if you haven't. But that is a very difficult thing that people all around us are carrying this morning. This morning. Catholics and Mormons call it excommunication. And uh, Scientologists call it disconnection. Jehovah's Witnesses call it disfellowshipping. Everybody's got a term for it. You know, in Christian circles, uh, the punishment for not keeping the traditions is often considered to be church discipline. Okay. Now, there is such a thing in the Bible as church discipline, if you will, Matthew chapter 18. Okay. But it's, the purpose of it is it has to do with transgressing uh, the com moral commandments of God. It has nothing to do with you didn't keep our traditions, so now we're going to exercise church discipline on you. It has to do with transgression, not tradition. And that's where most of the trouble lies. People make their tradition equal with God's commandment. Therefore, if you don't keep the tradition, we have ample reason to kick you out. <laughs> and the goal of the process, like I said, is laid out in Matthew uh, chapter 18, 15 through 18. Practically nobody goes by what the Bible actually says, at least in my 20 years of Christian life. I've, I've seen it one time where it was close, but still not quite the way the Bible says it. It's uh, rarely ever done the right way. But the goal in Matthew 18 is restoration and repentance. The goal is not expulsion. <laughs> Let's get to that third step as quick as possible so we can get this guy out of here. That's not the goal. <laughs> expulsion is the last resort for someone who's committing actual transgressions and refuses to repent. And even then, a step-by-step -step process is involved that gives the, time, the person ample time to repent. And when God's commandments are broken, a person should be pressured to, to repent. Uh, but when man's traditions are broken, you know what a person is pressured to do? <clears throat> Think about this. Keep this in the back of your mind. Uh, when, when God's commandments are broken, a person should be pressured to repent. Absolutely. We would agree with that. But when man's traditions are broken, you know what a person is pressured to do? Not repent. Recant. Recant. You can spot the true nature of a situation by whether a man is uh, being accused is being pressured to repent or to recant. <laughs> if he's being pressured by the ecclesiastical authorities to recant, chances are he's done nothing wrong. He's just rubbed someone the wrong way. Was not that the situation back in the Dark Ages with the Pope and Roman Catholicism? The, the command was always you need to recant your beliefs. It's not that they've done anything wrong. It's just you don't agree with the ecclesiastical authority and you need to change your mind. Yield your brain to me. And the men wouldn't do it. And they were literally burned at the stake for it. You see, the problem is not with the publican. The problem is with the Pharisee. You see? Society will often say, well, the problem is with the publican. Just recant and everything will be fine. But that's not the problem. The problem often is with the, not often, well, I'll just say the problem sometimes in these situations, in this context, is with the pastor, not the church member. The goal is not punishment and expulsion. The goal is to help a man who's fallen, not ritualistically kill him and bury him. <laughs> uh, when a man has a sickness, healthy people are supposed to try and heal him, not shoot him and throw him in the incinerator. <laughs> you know, that's something Pharisees do. The Bible says, uh, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. You know, when people fall, a Pharisee is a type of person who will deride the person for not being strong enough, or accuse the person of being a failure, or kick them while they're down, or cast them out of the synagogue. Why not help the guy? <laughs> you 
You know, I've noticed that over the years when a person leaves a church or is bullied out, the, the attitude in the church is, you know, oh, well, poor brother so-and-so, it's too bad that he left. You know, I, I heard he did all kinds of bad things and was really causing problems. Mm, that's too bad. I really liked that guy. Um, did you ever contact this awful sinner and try to help him? Uh, did anyone try to reach out and help this horrible sinner who's just been taken in this fault? Did anybody make any even an attempt? Oh, well, I'm sure the pastor did. I'm not talking about the pastor. I'm talking about you. This person that you said, where's your friend? Did you do anything to help that person? Most of the time, I would say practically all the time, like I said, I've been in, I've been in church and bible even church for a long time, a lot of different churches. I'm very familiar you know, with, with this stuff. Most of the time, the answer is no. Nobody tried. There was zero attempt to help that person. They were here for years. They served in the ministries here, but they didn't adhere to all the traditions one day. And so we cast him out. And you didn't even help the man with a single finger to help the person that fell. You didn't raise a finger to send a text message to see how he was doing. You didn't raise a finger to type an email, you know, to see if there was anything you could help the man with. You didn't even raise a finger to hit speed dial on your cell phone to talk to the brother to say, hey, brother, you know, what's going on? Is there anything I can do to help? You know, I heard that you're not coming to church anymore. Is there, what's going on? Is there anything I can do for you? No, most of the time, uh, people are just cut off and never spoken to again. That is the way it goes in Scientology, in Roman Catholicism, in Jehovah's Witness, in Mormonism, and sometimes even in Christian churches. You say, why? Because Christian churches are bad? No, it's a human nature thing. It's religious human nature that has nothing to do with the Spirit of God. That is not how God looks at things. That's not what God wants. That's not loving your brother, and that's not loving God. The traditions of the Pharisees are like uh, highly sensitive bombs. You know, they're armed when they place them on, their, on your back. And uh, if you remove them, you know, your life is instantly ruined. <laughs> it's like, oh, I wish I'd never taken this thing in the first place. Uh, but let me show you this in the Bible. Turn to John chapter 9. This is actually a very serious thing uh, that a lot of people are damaged with. Um, I get calls every once in a while. You know, people find our videos on YouTube and they'll call the church phone number. And uh, they've heard some of, you know, our preaching, me, Brother Rowley and Brother Peden. And uh, yeah, they'll, they'll tell me some of the things that have happened. You know, they're in other places in the country. And there's a lot of people that are really damaged by this thing right here, the tradition. There's a lot of people that are damaged by sin. Of course, we all know that. But this, for some reason, there's a blind eye turned to this stuff sometimes. And that causes a lot of problems. Look at John chapter 9. In John chapter 9, in this chapter, you have a guy that uh, Jesus heals a blind man on the Sabbath, evidently. And uh, it causes a major stir among the Pharisees. And in verse 18, it says, But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son whom ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. Uh, let's see. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. Look at verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared, feared, feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ... If you have your own personal opinion about this person going around that's named Jesus, if you have an opinion that doesn't agree with our opinion, this is what happens. He should be put out of the synagogue. Is that transgression? Is that some great and grievous sin that the man's committed? No. He just didn't yield his brain to the religious system. I'm not going to let these people think for me. I have an opinion. I think this guy might be the Christ. You're out of here. <laughs> and in verse 23, Therefore, said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Now consider how sick this situation is. Here you have a poor man who's been blind all his life, and he's miraculously healed. 
I mean, excited doesn't even begin to describe the emotions that this guy was experiencing. This is the greatest day which up to this point had been a total miserable life for this man. This is a great day. And here you have his own mother and father who maintain a cold, distant stoicism because of their stupid religion. They can't even rejoice with the man. Their own son. They can't be excited with him. They can't share in his joy because if they do, they might be punished and expelled from the synagogue. You say, well, that sounds like the Spirit of God to me. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But that's the system that man will impose. And that is very, that is very uh, uh, prolific in, uh, in the world. And so they are faced with a choice. Basically, they can choose their son or they can choose the synagogue. And instead of standing beside their, own, beside their own flesh and blood son, who's done nothing wrong, mind you, he hasn't done anything wrong. They distance themselves from him and say to the Pharisees, uh, you talk to him about it. We don't want to be a part of this. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. Like I said, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. That's a big deal for the people in those days. You get put out of the synagogue, you might as well be put out of society. You're like uh, kicked off, you're like banned from YouTube, something like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can't. You don't have access to the altar. That's a huge, big deal. Uh, you know, you're kicked out of society. You're ostracized. That, that's it's scary. It's a big deal. But who put that on these people? It, was that God or was it the Pharisees? The Pharisees had hijacked God's scriptures and were teaching and created their own religion. The young man was interrogated by Pharisees, and he gave. He always gave them the right answer, but it was never the answer they were looking for. <laughs> And uh, so they accuse him, you know, of being prideful. In verse 33, they throw him out. He, they said, if this man were of God, he could do nothing. That's what uh, the blind man told the Pharisees. Uh, they answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? <laughs> Who do you think you are? You think you're smarter and wiser than us? How could you be right and all of us Pharisees be wrong? And they cast him out. <laughs> right? The blind man saw a lot that day. Among all the other things he saw, he saw that religious man-made traditions are so powerful that they can split families apart. They saw that man-made religion is powerful. He saw also that Jesus truly cares and religion doesn't. Look at verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. He wasn't there when it happened, evidently, but he heard about it. And so what does it say? And when he had found him, he went seeking for the sheep. That was one of the indictments against the false prophets there in the book of Jeremiah. He says, you guys scatter my sheep and nobody goes and looks for them. And, he, and, the, Bible, and uh, the Lord blasted those prophets in Jeremiah's day. He, nobody's going out seeking the sheep. And here's a man who's out on his own. And so he, Jesus finds him. The greatest day of this kid's life was simultaneously the worst day of his life. I mean, you lose your parents, you lose your synagogue, you lose everything. Where is he going to stay? He can't go home because his parents can't, uh, we can't associate with you anymore. You've been excommunicated. His life would never be the same now that he had sight, but his life would never be the same now that he's been expelled from the synagogue. He lost everything and yet he gained everything. It's a weird paradox. And it's not uncommon for people who are in the burdensome system of the Pharisees to experience this kind of thing. Um, but he lost all his friends and his family and his acquaintances, but he gained the one that really matters, Jesus Christ. right? And Jesus found him. And that's wonderful because the Pharisees will make you think that God is only inside of their synagogue, their church, their system, their denomination, and he is not to be found outside of it. And so if you're cast out, you don't have access to God anymore. That's what a lot of people think. And that's why they stay in these abusive systems. You see, God's commandments and man's traditions have to maintain their proper order and placement. God's commandments above man's traditions. When man's traditions become equal with God's commandments, God leaves. And man has placed himself in the position of God. Because God gives certain commandments and man says, My commandments are just as important as your commandments, God. And so, yeah, you're on the throne, but I'm just going to kind of wiggle my way and sit on this throne with you, and we'll both give our commandments. And the Lord says, I'm out of here. See you later. Ichabod, the glory is departed, 
And what you have is a situation like you have at the end of the church age in Revelation 3 where Jesus is outside of the church standing and knocking. <laughs> and says, if any man will uh, hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and I'll sup with him and he with me. But this group, I don't know what's going on in there. They're worshiping somebody they call Jesus, but I'm out here. <laughs> a lot of times that's what happens. Now, let me ask you this. Is it better to be cast out and have Jesus or to be accepted in the group and uh, Jesus be nowhere in sight? Jesus. Jesus. Amen. amen. I, I agree. And there's often a lot of fellowship with the Pharisees, but man, their burden's heavy. And it's lonely with Jesus Christ, but his burden is light. Amen. amen? Which would you rather have? Think of how you, heed how you answer, because the Lord might put you in a situation someday where you'll have to uh, go with that. You know, see, what, see what's really the most important thing to you. Um, you know what people who have been cast out will tell you after the trauma of their rejection has subsided? I've got it right there. You read my notes. The best thing that's ever happened to them. It sounds like you know you've experienced that. It was hard and hurtful, but they're thankful that God did that for them. Because, why? Why would they say such a thing? Because when the Pharisees cast you out, you're no longer obligated to bear those burdens anymore. You're free. You're free of the burdens. The burdens go, to, go away and you have freedom from man's traditions. It's like a weight being lifted off your shoulders. Now let me just uh, kind of conclude with this thought. Uh, Jesus' yoke, his burden, is a cross. And yet his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Right? Uh, his burden is light not because the cross is light. It's not. The cross itself is, is heavy. It's a big cross. It's solid. And it's heavy. But it's light because Jesus helps you bear it. <laughs> He's bearing the weight. It's like an ox that walks beside you, bearing the yoke of the weight with you. He bears that weight. He, he is not like the Pharisees who won't lift it with one of their fingers. Jesus Christ will get under there and raise it up on his shoulder. And you know, you know how when you work with kids, you know, and you say, hey, carry this table with me. And you're carrying the whole weight of the table, but the kid just kind of thinks that he's carrying it. A lot of times that's the way it is with the Lord. He's the one carrying the weight. Yeah, it's the opposite with the Pharisees. They won't move them with one of their fingers. And a lot of times, Jesus will not only carry your cross and your burden, but He'll carry you on top of that Amen. when you can't even go on your own. The Pharisees won't do that. They'll just, uh, they won't help with the burdens of their own man-made traditions at all. They'll just reprimand and punish you when you fail. If Christianity is a massive burden to you this morning, then I recommend you take a step back and examine some things about yourself and about your beliefs. Because sometimes for Christians, even Christianity is perceived as burdensome sometimes. And so let's think about that for a second. Number one, are you born again? Trying to carry the weight, let's say, of Christianity or uh, New Testament Christianity or trying to please God and do what God says, for an unsaved man is impossible. That's going to be a major, massive weight that he is not equipped to carry. Okay? So there might be some people listening or watching or whatever who have been uh, feel burdened down with Christianity just as much as they would feel burdened down with any other religion. But it may be because you've never actually, there's never been a day and a time in your life where you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're trying to get to heaven on your own merit. And that's why it's so heavy. Jesus said his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And so if there's something about your Christian life that is not easy and not light... And I'm not saying that Christianity is always easy or anything like that. But what I'm saying is if, if Jesus' description, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, if that's not descriptive of your life, something's off. Something's out of place. Okay? One of the solutions could be that maybe you're not saved. I'm not trying to talk anybody out of their salvation or anything like that. If there is a time and a place where you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're saved. Don't worry about it. But uh, some people haven't done that. They would say, well, actually, no, there's never been actually a time. I was baptized back when I was three years old. You know, or I've, well, I've been in church all my life. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Number two, the reason why Christianity could be heavy and burdensome is maybe you might be indulging in sin. That's something that will weigh you down. It's not Christianity that's weighing you down. It's your sin that's weighing you down. That's a possibility. Uh, and uh, number three, the other thing, if it's not a bunch of sin in your life, if you're living a fairly clean life, trying to please the Lord, trying to stay confessed up and prayed up, you know, and walking with God on a daily basis, maybe the problem is this. Have you adopted a bunch of traditions into your life? 
Maybe they're disguised, and I want to be careful with saying this, but maybe they're disguised as convictions. And I'm not saying that what we call convictions are bad, but what you need to understand is that, a, is that technically conviction never shows up one time in the Bible. Again, I'm not saying that it's wrong. The word convict only shows up one time when the Pharisees are about to stone a woman caught in adultery and it says Jesus wrote on the ground and they were convicted in their conscience, right? That's the one time that convict shows up in the Bible. Uh, con convictions are supposed to be things that you're convinced of, right? And principles that uh, you follow your life by, and that's fine. But do not make your convictions equal with God's commandments. That's where I think... You know, religious traditions, you know, we think of Catholicism and, you know, some of those more uh, showy religions that have all the candles and all the other stuff that they do. And they're uh, chanting, you know, we think of traditions like that. Okay, I might use the word just for the sake of us Bible believers this morning because it's not far different. Sometimes convictions can become the commandments of God in your life to the point that... Uh, you know, you start requiring that everyone else has to have the same convictions as you. You've turned it into a commandment of God. And if somebody doesn't keep your list of do's and don'ts and your list of convictions, they're not right with God. Did God ever give you those convictions? Or is that just something you imposed on yourself? Or maybe some other spiritual person that you respect has those convictions and you decided to just take those convictions until you got some of your own. <laughs> you know, right? A little lesser roll off saying, not saying that that's necessarily bad, but that, you gotta watch it. You gotta watch it. Sometimes convictions is just our modern word for traditions. The Pharisees had a conviction about not picking corn on the Sabbath. The Pharisees had a conviction about washing their hands before they'd eat. They called it a tradition, but if you're to fast forward to the 21st century, they'd say that's our conviction, right? You can call a thing a conviction when it's no different than a tradition. And the reason why Christianity might seem so burdensome to you is because you've either allowed others to put their convictions on you, or you've loaded yourself down with your own convictions that are beyond what God requires of you. Okay? So you've got to be careful. Sinful nature likes to subtract from God's word. Oh, well, this sin is okay. Human na uh, religious human nature likes to add to God's word. God had a commandment not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Eve had a conviction. Her conviction was, I'm not going to touch that. Right? Genesis 3, 5, 3, 3. She said, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. You messed it up right there. God never said that. Eve, he did not say that. She elevated her conviction to the level of God's commandment. Whoops. That's what the Pharisees did. And maybe you should take some inventory of the various convictions or traditions you have and see if they've crept into the category of commandment and push them back down. Just keep that in mind. Man-made religiousness will kill uh, spiritually as fast as sin will. The letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. G Paul says, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. What's that? Sin? No. In the context, it's religiousness. There is liberty in Christ. Jesus said, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Do you have freedom? Do you have liberty? Or are those words that make you anxious? Oh, there's that freedom, liberty word. Careful. You know, let's add the asterisk after that word. You know, the disclaimer. Are those words that cause concern? Are those words that raise alarm bells? And the reason why I ask this is because I've been there before. You know, I've been there before. I've been that person at times. But why? Why should liberty and freedom raise alarm bells? Right? There's supposed to be liberty and freedom in true Christianity. Don't deny, deny that to others. And don't deny it to yourself. Right? By inventing a bunch of religious traditions. Rules and regulations are not the key to preventing sin and pleasing God. Being filled with the Spirit is the key to preventing sin and pleasing God. Let me just end with this. I've got, I was thinking about this this morning when this guy was uh, walking on the tight thing. I uh, have started 
to do some uh, Ninja Warrior gym training. I, I've always loved that kind of stuff. You know, the full body workouts, you know. But uh, I, I enjoy, I go to a ninja gym and I train on these crazy obstacles and do all these weird flying through the air and you know, all you see on the show. But uh, one of the things they have is a tightrope and you gotta learn how to balance on this tightrope. And one thing I've, if you've ever watched anybody balance on a tightrope or if you've ever balanced yourself, you know what you, what you don't do? What, you, you, you're not looking over here or over here. You know where you're looking? Straight. straight. Straight ahead. You keep your eyes right on. Let thy feet be right ahead of thee, like it says there in Proverbs. You know the other thing that you do? Your hands, you're, you, you don't walk like this. And uh, you, you don't walk like this. And uh, you don't walk like this. You know what you're doing? On a tightrope in order to stay on the straight and narrow? Because that's what we're talking about. True biblical Christianity is very straight. Okay? It, it's, it's narrow. And if you fall this way and you're, you're in the ditch, if you fall this way and you're in, in the ditch. And so it's very straight. The Word of God, the Scriptures. It's very straight, exactly. And so you're walking on that thing, and you know what you're doing with your hands? It's interesting. You're like this. You say, what's this? Well, this is the shape of a person hanging on a cross. What are you doing? In, spiritually speaking, you're identifying yourself with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's the key to victory over sin. That's the key to keep to pleasing God and keeping His commandments. It's not a matter of focusing on religious tradition. I just got to do this and this and this and this and then I'll please God. No, you'll fall off the edge. And it's not a matter of, well, I just have liberty and I'm just going to, that means that I can do anything I want and I can do anything I want, say anything I want with anybody who I want. You fall off of sin that way. It's an identification with Jesus Christ. I am dead to sin and I'm alive unto God. I am raised to walk in newness of life. Christ lives in me. It's the identification. So think about that. When you're balancing and when you're doing that, the way you stay on that thing and stay on the straight and narrow and get across to the other side is identification with Christ. That's the key. Let's pray. Father, I come before you this morning. I thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, that uh, we have something that's so much more than just one more set of rules and regulations. God, that maybe is just one more in a group of a bunch of other rules and regulations uh, in this community. God, it's not like that at all. Christianity, God, is so far above man-made religion. God, it actually gives victory over sin, and it gives freedom from bondage. Lord, and uh, God, it's, it's, very, it's an easy tendency, God, for moral people who want to please you uh, to be tricked by the devil into thinking that we have to now keep this new list of rules and regulations now that we're saved. And Father, it's not like that. God, the, the pleasure of the Lord uh, is, is, through, is in your, found in your Son. And uh, God, Jesus always does those th things that please the Father. And uh, you said that, uh, you know, if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Each side is taken care of by just walking in the Spirit. Help us, Lord, to be walking in the Spirit, to be identifying with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, to be identifying with that new man, the new man that we are in Christ, to identify and accept the fact that we have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, even if we don't always feel it. Help us just to believe these things by faith and start there, and then just walk in the Spirit and allow you to live your life through us. Father, please bless your word as it goes forth. And God, there's a lot of things that uh, people might have to take home and chew on for a while and think about for a while. I just pray you give them light and wisdom and uh, discretion and discernment, Father, if there's some convictions or traditions or rules and regulations that have been elevated to the height of God's word, your word, help them to see that and help them, Lord, to get that thing straightened out. I love you, Lord. I pray you bless the sermon this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.